Hello and welcome to another episode of Unworthy History. Today we got some more actual history for you from this book right here. Narrative of My Captivity Among the Sioux Indians by Fanny Kelly. This book was published all the way back in 1871. Now today is episode 2 in this series I'm doing over this book. And in this episode we'll learn about the fate of Fanny Kelly's husband. When the Indians fired their fatal volley into the midst of our little company, while yet we were preparing to entertain them with a hospitable supper, my husband was some distance from the scene of horror. But, startled by the unexpected report, he hurriedly glanced around, saw the pale, terror-stricken faces of his wife and child, and the fall of Reverend Sharp from the wagon, while in the act of reaching for sugar and other articles of food with which to conciliate our guests. The hopelessness of the situation struck a chill to his heart. Having laid down his gun to assist in the preparation of the feast, the utter futility of contending single-handed against such a host of infuriated attackers was too apparent. His only hope, and that a slight one indeed, was that the Indians might spare the lives of his wife and child to obtain a ransom. In this hope he resolved upon efforts for the preservation of his own life, and that he might afterward put forth efforts for our rescue, either by pursuit and strategy or by purchase. He was shot at, and the barbed arrows whizzed past him, some passing through his clothing. He saw Mr. Wakefield fall, and knew that he was wounded if not killed. Mr. Larimer passed him in his flight for life towards some neighboring timber. My husband then ran for some tall grass and sagebrush, where he concealed himself, favored by the fast approaching darkness. Scarcely daring to breathe, his mind tortured with agonizing fears for the fate of his wife and child. He seemed to hear from them the cry for help, and at one time resolved to rush to their rescue or to die with them. Any fate seemed better than such torturing doubt. But realizing at last the utter hopelessness of an attempt at rescue, and knowing that it was a custom of the Indians sometimes to spare the lives of white women and children taken captive, he again resolved, if possible, to save his own life that he might devote all of his energies and the remnant of his fortune that the Indians had not despoiled him of to the accomplishment of the rescue of his wife and child. Lying in his perilous shelter, he saw darkness creep slowly around the hills, closing on the scene of murder and devastation, like a curtain of mercy dropped to shut out a hideous sight. He heard the noise of breaking and crashing boxes and the voices of the Indians calling to each other. Then came the culmination of his awful suspense. The Indians had again mounted their horses and raising the terrible war song chanted its ominous notes as they took their way across the hills, carrying his yearning thoughts with them. Penn is powerless to portray the agony to him of those fearful moments. Still fearing to move in the darkness, he distinguished footsteps near him, and knew by the stealthy tread that they were those of an Indian. In breathless silence he crouched close to the ground, fearing each instant the descent of the tomahawk and the gleam of the scalping knife, when, strange to say, a venomous reptile came to his rescue, and his enemy fled before it. A huge rattlesnake, one of the many with which that region is infested, raised its curved neck close beside him, and thrusting forth its poisonous fangs gave a warning rattle. The prowling Indian took alarm at the sound. Other snakes roused for the safety of their young in the dens around, repeated it, and the Indian, knowing it would be death to venture further, retreated, leaving my husband in safety where he had taken refuge. For although he must have lain close to the noisome reptile, he received no hurt, and the greater horror of the human foe rendered him almost indifferent to the dangers of his surroundings. Cautiously he crawled out of the weeds and grass, and rising to his feet unharmed, started swiftly in an eastward direction. He had to go far out in the hills to avoid the Indians, and after traveling many miles around, he at last reached a large train, with which the small party I had seen pursued had previously taken refuge. They were already consolidating with other trains for defense, and would not venture to join Mr. Kelly, 
although he earnestly implored assistance to go out in aid of his friends and family if any of them should be left alive. One of our servants, Andy, soon after joined them. He came in running and in great excitement and was about to report all of the company killed when he joyfully discovered Mr. Kelly. Great consternation and alarm had spread with the tidings of the massacre, and fears for personal safety prevented anyone from joining my unhappy husband in efforts to rescue his wife and child, or succor his missing companions. Women in many instances drove the teams, to prevent their husbands or fathers being taken at a disadvantage. Weapons were in every man's hands, and vigilant eyes were fixed on every bluff or gorge anticipating attack. A little time and travel brought them to the first scene of murder, where they found the dead body of the companion of the man who so narrowly escaped with his family. They placed his body in a wagon, and proceeded to the dreaded spot where the slaughter of our party had occurred. The wagons still were standing, and feathers, flour, the remnants of much that was but half destroyed, lay scattered about the ground. My husband, with faltering steps, supported by the strong arm of Andy, was among the first to search the spot. His intense distress for the unknown fate of his family urged him on, although he dreaded to think of what the bloody spot might disclose to him. The dead bodies of Mr. Sharp, Mr. Taylor, and our servant Franklin were discovered lying where they had fallen. Poor Frank had been shot by an arrow that pierced both his legs, pinning them together, in which condition he had been murdered by the ruthless wretches by having his skull broken. Both Mr. Sharp and Mr. Taylor left large families at home to mourn their loss. Mr. Larimer came up with an arrow wound in one of his limbs. He had passed the night in trying to elude his pursuers, and was very tired and exhausted, and very much distressed about his wife and son, a robust little fellow of eight or nine years old. But Mr. Wakefield was nowhere to be seen. After searching the brushwood for some time, and a quarter of a mile distant from the scene of attack, they discovered him still alive, but pierced by three arrows that he had vainly endeavored to extract, succeeding only in withdrawing the shafts, but leaving the steel point still deeply embedded in his flesh. Mr. Kelly took him and cared for him, with all the skill and kindness possible. No brothers could have been more tenderly attached to each other than they. He then procured as comfortable a conveyance as he could for them, and picked up a few relics from our demolished train. Among them was a daily journal of our trip, from the time we were married until the hour that the Indians came upon us. This he prized, as he said, more than he did his life. The next thing that was necessary to do after the wounded were cared for was to bury the dead, and a wide grave was dug and the four bodies solemnly consigned, uncoffined to the earth. A buffalo robe was placed above them, and then the earth was piled on their unconscious breasts. At that time the question of color had occasioned much dissension, and controversy ran high as to the propriety of allowing the black people the privilege of sitting beside their white brethren. Poor Franklin had shared death with our companions, and was not deemed unworthy to share the common grave of his fellow victims. They lie together in the valley of Little Box Elder, where with saddened hearts our friends left them, thinking of the high hopes and fearless energy with which they had started on their journey, each feeling secure in the success that awaited them, and never for a moment dreaming of the grave in the wilderness that was to close over them and their earthly hopes. They were buried on the desolate plain a thousand miles away from their loved wives and children, who bemoan their sad, untimely fate. Mr. Kelly found part of his herd of cattle grazing nearby. Mr. Sharps were still tied to the stake where he had carefully secured them. The Indians had taken our horses but left the cattle, as they do when they are on the warpath, or unless they need meat for present use. They shot some of them, however, and left them to decay upon the plain. Many arrows were scattered upon the ground, their peculiar marks showing that their owners had all belonged to one tribe, though of different bands. They were similar in form and finish. The shafts were round and three feet long, grooved on their sides that the blood of the victim might not be impeded in its outward flow. 
Each had three strips of feathers attached to its top, about seven inches in length, and on the other end a steel point fastened lightly so as to be easily detached in the flesh it penetrates. The depth of the wound depends on the distance of the aim, but they sometimes pass quite through the body, though usually their force is exhausted in entering a few inches beyond the point. The wounded being made as comfortable as circumstances would allow, the train left the spot in the evening and moved forward to an encampment a mile distance from the sad place, where the journey of our lost companions had ended forever, whose visions of the golden land must be a higher and brighter one than earthly eyes can claim. Early the next day the travelers arrived at Deer Creek Fort, where Mr. Kelly found medical aid for the wounded, and procured a tent to shelter them, and devoted himself to alleviating their sufferings, and with the assistance of the kind people of the fort, succeeded in arranging them in tolerable comfort. Captain Reinhardt was the commanding officer at Deer Creek, and ordered the property of the deceased to be delivered over to him, which Mr. Kelly did. The story of the attack and massacre had traveled faster than the sufferers from its barbarity. The garrison had learned about it before the train arrived, through some soldiers returning from Fort Laramie, where they had been to receive money from the paymaster, who had heard an account of the attack on the road, and had a passing glimpse of the terrible field of slaughter. The evening that the large train arrived at the fort, the officers gave a ball, and the emigrant women were invited from the trains camped in the vicinity to join in these inappropriately timed festivities. The mother of the child who had so narrowly escaped death, having lost her own wardrobe in her efforts to escape the pursuit of the Indians, borrowed a dress from a lady who resided at the fort, and attended the entertainment dancing and joining in the gaieties when the burial of their companion and our poor men had just been completed, and the heavy cloud of our calamity had so lately shrouded them in gloom. Such are the effects of isolation from social and civil influence, and contact with danger and familiarity with terror and death. People grow reckless and often lose the gentle sympathies that alleviate suffering from frequent intercourse with it in its worst forms. So that's the end of this episode. Here Mr. Kelly was able to escape with the help of some rattlesnakes who scared off the Indian who was looking for him. This is episode two in my series on the captivity of Fanny Kelly, and in the next episode we'll hear Fanny Kelly tell about the beginning of her captivity. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.